A good year has passed uh, since the last TVG conference, um, and now it has just started. And again, I'm here to address a few words to you. A big thank you for that for the organizers, and of course to Gregory Lola Frost to give me this opportunity. Last year, I explained you. Um, to you why, in my opinion, Islam represents the greatest danger for Europe. One year later, I have to make a statement, uh, this statement a little bit more precise, or rather add to it, because more rather dark storm clouds have appeared on the horizon, and by that I do not mean the Ukrainian war alone. Don't get me wrong, the Islam is still, and with its mass immigration, uh, it remains the greatest threat to Europe, to our culture, traditions, and our values. But allow me to briefly inform you about some new developments, just as Gregor said, from a, a German perspective. In my last speech, I mentioned the enormous numbers of refugees um, who come to Europe and especially to Germany. I spoke about 10,000 refugees coming to Germany every month. In the meantime, we are talking about 2,500 refugees in the provincial state of Saxony alone. The Federal Republic of Germany has 16 of these provinces, and if we just take an average of 1,500 refugees per province, we are already at 24,000 who stream into Germany every month. And just, these, just a tiny fraction of these people are actually able and willing to adapt to our culture. All these others automatically create a parallel society due to a lack of language skills and a complete different socialization. Last year I also spoke about crime rates. These have also gone up, but the authorities make it harder and harder for us to find the statistics and to interpret them correctly because information is deliberately left out. And this is all done to cover up how high the percentage of foreigners is in the crime statistics. You can be sure that only a small, a small part of them are able to present actual reason for asylum that would legitimize them to remain in Germany. Most of them, I would say approximately 90%, should have been turned away immediately at the border and the laws for this are existing. They just simply are not applied. And remember, it was the former Chancellor, Angela Merkel, who illegally suspended German asylum law, the Dublin III regulations, and Schengen, and the Schengen Agreement. To be frank, it is nothing less than <clears throat> treason, and it should be punished accordingly. And I'm pretty sure you feel quite sure you feel the same way about this invasion that is happening in the UK. But instead, Merkel receives the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honor, which is France's highest award, the UNESCO Peace Prize, and just a few days ago, uh, the Nansen Award, and now it comes for her refugee policy. I knew that the French are sometimes not very clear in the head, but let's be fair, I'm sure the ordinary French people will see this quite differently. Um, Merkel has been, of course, very helpful to people like Macron in many ways, but uh, surely not by protecting the interests of the German people. The Balkan route is, again, extremely busy, and Afghans, Syrians, and Iraqis in particular are using it to reach Germany. In addition, more war refugees are arriving from the Ukraine at this very moment. However, one can also observe very interesting things in Germany with a regard to these Ukrainian refugees. According to the Ukrainian government, men between the age of 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave the country. However, it is remarkable how many relatively young as well as middle-aged men <clears throat> have left their country and drive around in vehicles that are defined as above the average value, and they do it in Germany, they do it in the UK and elsewhere in Europe. And not to mention all the lovely S-Class Mercedeses and Bentleys I have seen myself. Well, this reminds me again of a report of the second German television, um, which not too long before the war started, reported on the most corrupt country in Europe, the Ukraine. And here's something even more remarkable, and it makes, oh, that was too much. <laughs> the normal citizen could imagine 
that such bus companies as Flixbus, which travels to the Ukraine, are fully booked for months in the westbound direction. But why on earth should this also be the case eastbound to Kiev? Well, the answer is relatively simple. And even Friedrich Merz, the chairman of the CDU of the Christian Democratic Union Party, or to be more precise, the fake conservatives, recently dared to say it so openly, but apologized nicely after a shitstorm from the do-gooders hit him. And the IFD has criticized it much earlier, but we have been accused spreading only fear and agitation. Anyway, what do all refugees want most of all? Of course, it is the German money. And the Ukrainian refugees receive it immediately in the form of a full standard rate for unemployment benefit. However, no one checks, really, if they are actually in Germany within the approved period or not. A toast again to Germany, the land of milk and honey, unless you are German. In which case, you only get in trouble for having the cheek to demonstrate and to defend your people's basic rights. Opportunity makes the thief, and German governments, probably like in the UK, has nothing, had nothing better to do for decades than to give foreigners the opportunity to take advantage of. And shamefully, it makes no difference whether they were illegal refugees or foreign governments, at the latter at least in the case of Germany. But our, con our current government really has taken the biscuit. Election promises are being broken by the dozens. Their political decisions are literally steering Germany towards the abyss from which it can no longer pull itself out by its own bootstraps. And um, this German spirit that's uh, so often praised everywhere except in Germany. Incompetence at the highest level and mendacity are the essential characteristics with which the government can be briefly and indeed adequately described. The fish starts to stink at the head. At least that's an old German proverb, and the political, the political hat in Germany can no longer be described as fresh from any direction. Before Olaf Scholz became chancellor, he was a mayor in Hamburg and got entangled in a web of financial crime and has been suffering from chronic forgetfulness ever since. Interestingly, he also cultivated the best connections to the regime of the former communist GDR and he had contacts with the Stasi. Despite the fact that all of these things were already known before the elections, the Social Democratic Party won the election with such an individual. But why? why are, but while we are on the subject on German leadership, the Vice Chancellor and so-called Minister of Economics, Robert Habeck, should not be missed. Actually, one would, assume, would have to assume that someone who holds such an important office as a Minister of Economics should also, so, uh, also know something about this subject. Well, not in this case. In Europe's largest economy, a child's book author is at work. And this is not a joke. However, the so-called Minister of Economics proved his incompetence live on German television when he stated that bakers, craftsmen, and other businesses would not automatically be insolvent. When they ran out of money, they would just stop producing. Also a way of talking things up, right? The Green have shown their true colors after the election anyway. They have become the biggest warmongers in Germany, and their sick energy policy, which is more likely a religious fanatism, similar to that of the Islam, is leading the people in Germany to ruins by the millions in the upcoming winter. The gas prices in Germany have increased 30-fold in some cases. Families suddenly have to spend the majority of their income to satisfy their basic need for warmth. And what is the government doing? Well, they're issuing slogans of perseverance that are no longer surpassable in terms of stupidity, such as freeze for peace. <laughs> the Green Party, but also the other parties, with the exception of the AfD, and to be fair, the left sometimes as well in that, in that regard, are making things very easy for themselves. Russia must be pressed hard wherever it is possible. 
That's why the sanctions are needed, preferably as many and as harshly as possible. Without, however, being aware of the consequences for their own population or domestic economy in certain areas. Thus, massive sanctions are imposed on so-called key sectors, such as energy or the economy. One can, and one can be divided as whether economic sanctions that hit German small and medium-sized businesses hard, especially in the former East and Germany, do make sense, especially when it comes to goods and commodities that are no longer or not at all strategic, of strategic value or have any military use. The effects of a, mis, of a misguided sanctions policy are even more obvious in the area of the energy supply. You may have been fo to follow it a little in your own news um, due to the energy sanctions against Russia with the regard to oil and coal. Germany also now wants to do it without Russian gas as much as possible. The Russians have now partially cut off their supplies to Germany as well, for good reason, I think. The result is that gas is, be gas is becoming extremely, uh, is, is becoming un un unaffordable for thousands of households. And therefore, hundreds of employees in the gas receiving stations are already on short time work and might even lose their jobs altogether. And not to mention the hundreds of thousands of jobs in the German industry that are being lost because companies have to file for insolvency because they can no longer pay their energy bills. But to say it with the minister's logic, they are not insolvent, they have just stopped producing. That this is a major problem, especially for the structurally weak regions in eastern Germany, is something that any schoolboy can imagine, but not our completely underqualified and therefore overpaid politicians. Or they may not be interested because they would much rather pretend to be important in the international arena instead of taking care of their own people. The Minister of Economic Affairs has been calling on the population to save energy for months. Instead of that, he could have simply refrained from the senseless energy sanctions against Russia and realized that it is a field in which it is difficult to put Russia under pressure, while causing massive damages to the economy of our own country. The share of Russian gas in Germany in 2021 was 55%. And Russia has 17% share of the world gas market. So based on these facts, how do these green echo fundamentalists intend to make Germany independent from Russian gas without completely ruining the economy and the population? Minister Habeck actually prefers to fly to Qatar and try to buy gas there, kowtowing to the Sheikh only to end up empty-handed. And by the way, Qatar is the country <clears throat> where the Greens and all the other do-gooders got so worked up about the violation of human rights. And it is still the country where women's rights are a foreign word. And life can be so simple if you're inconsistent and forgetful, right? The next strange incident happened on the 27th of September when an act of sabotage was committed to both Nord Stream pipelines. After it was clear that it was sabotage, a culprit had to be found as quickly as possible. And of course, it was found. It was the Russians themselves. At least, that is uh, the opinion of the Norwegian uh, military scientists and naval officer Eva Strömen. In his opinion, only Russia has the means and the plausible cause uh, or reason to blow up its own pipelines. I mean, this is supposedly how Russia wants to legitimize the fact that it is not currently sending gas to Europe. Excuse me, but either this man has recently definitely escaped from a lunatic asylum or he was been paid a lot of money to publicly say such a nonsense with his, in his own name. That a major US naval unit moved through the Baltics at the same time as the sabotage was, of course, completely coincidental. incidental. But let's look at the whole thing briefly through criminal glasses. In order to commit a crime of any kind, you need a motive, you need the means, and of course, you need the opportunity to commit the act. Who else would come uh, into question for this deed? 
A very difficult question, isn't it? Maybe the USA? Hmm. What about it? The USA is definitely, they, they, the USA definitely has the motive. For years, the Americans have opposed the building of the Russian pipelines and have been trying in vain to sell their own fracking gas in, um, at high prices. And there are documents proving that the American administration was willing to take the necessary actions in Europe to sell their own energy resources. And I think only those who still believe that there were really mass uh, weapons of mass destruction in the Iraq will doubt that the Americans have the means to carry out such an action. The opportunity has certainly been favorable at this time, even though it might look a bit too obvious. In my opinion, these, the dense maritime surveillance in the Baltic Sea, especially at the current time, also speaks against the fairy tale that the Russians blew up their own pipelines. This brief evidence uh, should be rounded up with the words of Joe Biden, who in January of this year actually already formulated a very solid confession in front of the press um, <clears throat> by clearly saying that should the Russians invade the Ukraine, there will be no more North Stream 2. When asked by a reporter how they were going to do this, since it was basically a project under German sovereignty, Biden replied that she, that she could be assured they will find a way. If that is not enough, the Victoria Newland, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, repeated these words on another occasion. Well, the Americans have put people away <laughs> where the chain of evidence was far more incomplete than what I've just presented to you. So why does no one from the official side come up with the idea of at least naming the USA as a main culprit? At this point, it is not clear what will happen, but the events could not be worse. Earlier the same day, Russia again clearly underlined the condition of a nuclear first strike, clearly and unambiguously mentioning the danger of an existential threat to Russia, for example, from conventional weapons, which are currently being brought to the Ukraine en masse, financed by the European and the American taxpayers. This act of pipeline sabotage can certainly be seen as an existential threat to Russia, and as it makes it impossible to restart the pipelines and uh, for an indefinite period of time, even if the conditions would return to normal. The damage here is unquestionably, uh, unquestionably in the billions. But maybe all of this was just a small attention getter among friends. And they wanted to make it clear that the German Chancellor uh, should intensively reconsider his position with the regard to deliver the to, uh, delivery of the German Leopard II main battle tanks to the Ukraine. The Americans, civilized as they always profess to be, did not wait long to, rep uh, to respond to this Russian threat. If the worst came to the worst, the complete destruction of the Russian Black Sea Fleet with conventional weapons, of course, would be the just American answer. And in these really tense times when we actually need qualified and rhetorically well-trained foreign policy experts, we, the Germans, have Annalena Baerbock, our foreign minister. The nightmare of every good foreign politician and the bad joke that brings shame to your face. Apart from the fact that almost all of her appearances, speeches and press releases are an unbearable mutilation of the German language for any half-educated and rhetorically qualified person, they also most, are mostly unacceptable in terms of content. And I would like to make up, you know, I would like to take you up with one example in which she, uh, she spoke before the German parliament about heavy weapons in one of her statements regarding arms delivery. She literally said in this context, suddenly we are talking about cheetahs, leopards, and pumas. What kind of animal tanks are these that nobody ever heard of before? Well, as a German minister of foreign affairs, you can't be more ridiculous than that. Because even a green should not be unaware of 80 years of German military traditions. And by the way, why break with traditions? The brand new German main battle tank will also get a very familiar name. It will be called the Panther. 
German foreign policy has been characterized by a facelessness for decades. To put it precisely, there is no independent sovereign for, uh, foreign policy and it was made sure that, not, that no German came anywhere near important ministerial posts who actually wanted to act in politics for the German people and in the interest of Germany. The current German foreign policy is only there to support the geopolitical interests of the Americans wherever it is necessary. The current foreign minister even confirmed publicly in an interview that the interests of the German people are irrelevant, saying that she would support the Ukraine at any cost and for as long as it is necessary, no matter what her German, German voters would thought about it. I would call this treason, but in any case, it's a slap in the face of democracy, which these people actually supposedly want to protect from us. Germany, or in this case the German industry, has so far delivered weapons worth of 745 million euros to the Ukraine. These deliveries are financed by the German so-called upgrading initiative, using of course 100% taxpayers' money. At the end, <clears throat> an end to this delivery is currently not in sight. There are a few points to be mentioned in this context to make the, uh, that make these, the whole thing uh, <clears throat> rather tricky. The mere supply of military material by industry is in fact perfectly legitimate. The thing to do since it is based on private economic interest. For some, the payment of these goods with tax money from a state that is not involved is already an interference and a particular clear determination of which side of the conflict one is on. It is important to know that all these deliveries of military materials are subject to approval by the federal government and or the Ministry of Economics. This means that not a single screw that is needed for the repair of military materials is leaving Germany without the knowledge of the government. Of course, this applies all the more to heavy weapons. You may remember the discussion about the delivery of the German self-propelled Howitzer BZH-2000. After masses of insolence and arrogant statements by the Ukrainian ambassador in Berlin and presumably intensive talks between the US leadership and Chancellor Scholz, uh, the delivery was agreed to, but not only that. They also agreed to train Ukrainian soldiers for this weapon system on German soil. Under international law, this can in no way be interpreted as a neutral, non-intervening action on the part of Germany. Furthermore, the German government allowed the USA to train Ukrainian soldiers in Germany for the war against Russia. In the view of many neutral observers and international law experts, this too is an active entry into the existing conflict on the part of the German government. The German people were, of course, not consulted about this, and they were also, they were even left in the dark completely. To justify all this by saying the German democracy is also defended in the Ukraine is just as big as a nonsense as when the former defense minister Peter Struck said that German security is being defended also in the Hindukush mountains. A person with common sense could reply that, in fact, that would not have been necessary at all if one had not interfered in the affairs of foreign and moreover sovereign states in the first place and that one was in any case only trying to do, as a compliant lacai of the USA, to straighten out what they have messed up. Anyone who allows himself to be harnessed, harnessed to such a card has long since abandoned his own sovereignty as a state and of course as a government. I am, as you can imagine, highly ashamed of this incompetence that can hardly be described in words and that can only be dismissed as stupidity. But it would be a mistake, and certainly too short-sighted. But madness made to order, carried out by compliant servants of those who are trying to impose a one-world order upon us, my dude. Another insane scenario has been unfolding for some months now in the Baltic states. In Lithuania, the Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielis Landsbergis began destroying his country with a stroke of economic policy genius. Lithuania was the first state in Europe that recognized Taiwan in order to really get one over on Red China. 
China, of course, immediately severed all economic ties with Lithuania, but that was not enough for Landsbergis. He banned the neighboring Belarus from transporting tra potassium to the Baltic port of Klaipeda, where it was shipped to China. The, this cost the port about 60% of its revenue. The jobs of the people were again completely unimportant. The Landsberg's masterstroke, however, was the prohibition of Russian overland deliveries through Lithuania to the Kaliningrad, um, or more properly, Königsberg exclave. The Western press initially celebrated this heroic act and it, was and it was surprised that Russia took very little pleasure in it. Russia then officially announced that it would no longer recognize the external borders agreed with Lithuania if access to the exclave and the movement of goods were not made possible again. It is important to know that an essential condition for Lithuania's independence was the unhindered transit traffic to the exclave. Russia announced harsh reactions and after careful consideration in Washington and Brussels, the EU called that terrier back. One thing is undoubtedly certain. The decision to take such a drastic measure was not born in Vilnius. There were people at work here who, just as in Germany or in the case of the pipeline, gas pipelines, are obviously pursuing an agenda on their own. It is clear that there is no interest in de-escalating this tense situation. Quite the opposite is the case. The destabilization of Europe is now being pushed forward on another level with more far-reaching consequences than the obviously too protracted process of population exchange. And um, developments in Europe are really worrying in many respects. Some problems are obvious, such as uh, the migration of illegal immigrants, or at least for the Eurozone, the massive inflation of more than 10% or self-made energy crisis. The geopolitical shifts, however, um, are less obvious, but they are offer no less great fuel for further disputes. The Poles are currently gaining influence in, the Eastern, Europe, uh, in Eastern Europe through this approach and are willingly being harnessed to the, the chariot of the neocons. Two essential goals <clears throat> to occupy Europe with itself and to continue to bleed Germany dry. These are the two essential goals they are <clears throat> trying to follow up. Both are achieved by creating various uh, trouble spots and problems in Europe and by separating Europe's largest economy from the one of its most important energy suppliers and trading partner. That this um, aforementioned madness follows an ordered method methodology is quite clear because the Poles also made an interesting contribution in that regard. At the very beginning of this war, the Poles suddenly had the brilliant idea of handing over mix to the Ukraine in a ring exchange. In return, they were to receive F-15 fighter planes from the Americans. The deal was to be settled in Rammstein. Just imagine this. A NATO member provides fighter planes to a warring party and instead of selling them regularly, um, this NATO member receives an upgrade of its own arsenal from another NATO member and it is all done on the territory of another NATO member. Too much media attention and the obvious fact that this would have uh, amounted to direct NATO interference in the conflict made the Americans to refrain from this venture. But we can clearly see that it is very dangerous at this moment to rely on NATO as a security guarantor. What this conflict also does is to revive a de facto superfluous institution, NATO, which is ultimately nothing more than a proxy organization of the USA to enforce its geopolitical interests in Europe. That countries like Sweden or Finland now want to join NATO shows that one of the desired goals has already been successfully achieved stirring up fear and successfully manipulating with fear, by fear. NATO is now suddenly giving a new importance as a guarantor of security for the Western world, but nothing can be further from the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I estimate the future share of the new members at no less than 200 million euros per year, per country, just for being able to call themselves NATO members. But in the event of an emergency, one cannot be sure that anyone will rush to their aid or 
and defense, because Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which is always cited as an argument for membership, states exclusively that NATO partners may take, may take measures they deem necessary up to and including the use of armed force. In plain language, this means that each NATO member decides for itself whether it will provide assistance in an emergency or not. The Poles still seem to be firmly convinced that NATO and their American partners will stand by them if the worst comes to the worst. And they are using the opportunity to make direct use of their newly acquired influence. The fact that, the Pol that Poland is currently trying to breathe new life in an old idea is absolutely no coincidence. And unfortunately, it is also supported by British and US governments. This is an idea from the 1930s, which, if it had been implemented, would inevitably have led to a war because of, these, because of the policies clearly directed against Russia and Germany. Now this idea is being propagated again. I am talking about the idea of the intermarium. Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine and Slovakia are proposed to unite in an Eastern European Union under Polish leadership essentially with similar characteristics to the EU. The intermarium concept creates new spheres of influence and what is particularly delicate, new fault lines within Europe. But Poland wants even more. The Lithuanian government is currently secretly discussing a Polish proposal for a sort of resurrection of the former union of the Polish-Lithuanian state. And it does not seem to be the case, and it does seem to be the case, as it has been confirmed to me by various sources from Poland and Lithuania, that Poland is secretly even considering an annexation of the exclave of Königsberg. On the one hand, this would be a double breach of international law, but much more serious is the fact that the NATO state is actually considering provoking openly war with a nuclear power over a territory which they have no, uh, not the slightest claim, neither historically nor politically. A good friend of mine was an employee of the US State Department and consul in Warsaw in the 1990s, and he confirmed such aspirations of the Poles already at that time. He was approached at the time with the proposal to return former territories to Lithuania if they were supportive in their efforts to seize Königsberg. His task would have been to convince the Lithuanian government of this plan. With all due respect for the fact that uh, together with the Hungarians, they prevented many decisions that would have been bad for the nation states of Europe, it is time to clearly show the Poles their limits. International law applies either to all people and nations, that means also to war losers, or to none at all. Poland obviously can't get enough. Despite Stalin giving them the German eastern provinces, the Soviet occupation zone in, in, the Soviet occupation zone in 1945, they illegally seized Stettin a short time later, although it was supposed to belong to the territory of the GDR. Despite having already paid reparations, it is Poland that keeps making new demands on Germany and is now demanding 1.3 billion euros 77 years later. Its entire motorway network and many other modernizations were financed by the European Union and therefore with a large amount of German taxpayers' money. We haven't received any thank you for that. Must stop this dangerous implementation of its own geopolitical interests because nothing can be more destructive than a completely excessive need for recognition coupled with a pathological and historical proven overconfidence, which has the potential to plunge Europe into another great war. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude my speech with an appeal, a request, because desperate times do need desperate measures. We all love our fatherlands, we love our traditions and values, our culture, our heritage, and of course our people. We do not want our Europe to degenerate through the perfidious machinations of the globalists and the neo-communists 
into a unitary state like the USA, where the only thing that is holding this state together is a, su is a superficial patriotism based neither on traditions nor on values. For this reason, many of us fight every day somehow with our means against this threat. But we are neither sufficiently networked nor do we uh, actively cooperate with each other to a sufficient degree. What is an even bigger problem, however, is the lack of financial resources. Dear friends, our adversaries have hundreds of billions of euros, dollars or people, uh, pounds at their disposal. Money is not an issue, at least on their side, and they buy good people every day, even from our ranks, because many of us are not able to continue our struggle due to a lack of financial security, because sometimes you have to decide and you have to choose between idealism and the welfare of your own family. We all have to be ready to give more, more of our time, more of our courage, but as well more of our money, which is urgently needed to advance the salvation of our nation states and our cultural heritage. What happens to our money if things do not turn out well? It will be devalu uh, devaluated by ever increasing inflation due to irresponsible monetary policy. There is even the danger of, banking, of a banking system collapse. What good will our money do if one day we can no longer live according to our values? If we have to bow to foreigners who have done nothing to make Europe the only true civilization? We will have nothing of our money when sick globalists instigate stupid people to set up powder kegs for them all over our beloved Europe. We will lose everything if we do not together stop and reverse this disastrous development. I am not prepared to give up, and I'm definitely not prepared to give even a penny of my wealth to a state that does not even begin to represent my interest. Yeah. And, and that is why I will establish a foundation with the sole aim to preserving, of preserving the sovereignty of nation states and protecting their, nation, their traditions and values. The advantage of a foundation is that the purpose of the foundation can be clearly formulated and that the use of the assets is also properly determined so that no one can enrich themselves privately. We need more of our, we need more television stations we need more of our own media that can transport our, new, our news unfiltered into every household. We need places in every country um, where our fellow campaigners and interested people can be trained and informed. We need to stand stronger and more united together than ever before. We need to show that true patriots like us can work together across borders with trust and with common goals. And we can achieve all of this and much more if we are all prepared to do everything for the preservation of our nations, our values and traditions, but above all, for a secure future of our children and grandchildren where they can grow up and live safely, happily, but above all, according to our rules and our ideas. I invite you all to join in creating the foundation on which we can anchor our Europe, our nation states, and the sovereignty of our peoples anew. Only together we will be able to master this task, but without the will to do more, and this applies actually to all of us, we will lose this battle, and therefore we will lose our Europe, we will lose our nations and our nation states, and we will lose ourselves and God alone will not be able to save us from this fate. It requires, it, re it requires our courage and our energy to change this. Well, nevertheless, thank you very much for your attention. God bless Europe and our nations.